We're going to jump in and get going. Philippians chapter 3. How many of you love a good conflict? Yeah. <laughs> that many, huh? <laughs> Once upon a time in a, fa- in, a, in a land far, far away, uh, I had a guy in my church, he loved conflict. In fact, uh, he loved to just try to light as many fires as he could and see what all it burned. He liked conflict. Uh, I actually believe that he went home feeling really good about himself if he caused something to happen during the church service. Um, I'm telling you, I actually went back there because you could tell something was going on in the foyer. It was getting heated up and actually went back there, and he was trying to get a deacon to meet him anywhere, anytime after church, so they could fight. (laughs) This guy liked conflict. Um, And, you know, uh, people try to avoid him. (laughs) I mean, he was like a landmine. You just did not know when, where, and how. And... uh, he pushed. He pushed for conflict. There are people like that, aren't there? Um, they're not happy until everybody's miserable. However, um, even when you don't have somebody like that in the mix, the truth of the matter is that conflict is inevitable if you are determined to live a committed life for Jesus Christ. It is inevitable. Paul never went looking for trouble. But every city that he went to, all he had to do was begin to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, bring light into that darkness that was there in that community. And as soon as he began to shine brightly with the the love of Jesus Christ and the gospel message of Jesus Christ, those who had hard hearts, those who had evil ways, Boom, conflict was on, right? He, cre- he, he saw conflict everywhere he went. The brighter the light, the greater the reaction from darkness. Now think about that for a moment. The brighter the light, the greater the reaction of darkness. You turn on a, a I don't know, 5,000 watt luminous or whatever it is. Anyway, you turn on one of those really bright things like that and, and, and darkness is like, right? And then if you've got one of those that you can turn on just gradually, just barely starts affecting it, the brighter the light. So that poses the question, if the darkness is not bothered, is the light on? That's sort of what we're going to be focused in on today. If the darkness is not bothered, is the light on? Uh, I don't know if you've done this very many times, but I've hit the switch and nothing happened because the bulb was out. Darkness wasn't bothered because nothing happened. The challenge question for us today is this. Are we being effective if our presence in the darkened society is not creating any kind of conflict? Now, you, you can look at this and you can say, well, you know, Pastor, what are you after? You after a fight? I'm not after a fight. Not at all. Um, I'm just concerned that the church might be missing something that the church ought to be experiencing. Did you hear that? That's my concern, is that there's something that ought to be that if it's not, that should be alarming. That should be concerning. So are we being effective if our presence in darkened society is not creating any conflicts? So I want you to look at our passage today because it's going to be focused in this area. Philippians 1, verse 27. It says, only let the manner of life 
I left out a word. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. When you see a phrase like, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, what does that do? What, is, what does that challenge you to do? For me, it makes me examine myself, makes me scrutinize my day-to-day -day living. Is the life that I'm living worthy of the gospel of Christ? Is it, is it doing justice to the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It makes me check myself. So here's my question for all of us. Does our life advance the good news of Jesus? Does our life advance the good news of Jesus? Folks, that's a lot different than just the whole idea of being Christians in this time. I've about come to this conclusion that being a Christian now is just barely above, right? It's, it's everybody that's not an atheist. <laughs> that's pretty much it, you know? A person can now say, well, I'm a Christian, and basically they, they believe in something. They just are not atheist. <clears throat> but I want to challenge you with some cons things to consider today. First of all, this, you are a billboard. Just like out there on the highway, you're a billboard. I'm a billboard. Does your billboard, my billboard, does it promote a message of hope? Does it convey that Jesus is the giver of a transformed life? He has the power to transform lives. Does it, does it give that message or does it basically just promote us as good people? I have some news for you. Jesus did not die on the cross so that we could just live our lives out as good people because those billboard signs are not effective. They're not effective at all. <clears throat> they don't show Jesus, they just pretty much show us, okay? So come on, if you drive by a billboard and there is a person's smiling face on the billboard, no words, no nothing, just a smiling face. What's the message? Doesn't have one. So the world looking at you and me and just seeing us smile as we're going through life and being cordial and, and little acts of kindness and whatever we might be doing, is, is that actually giving to them the message that they are desperately in need of? You see, if no one is challenged to look to Jesus Christ to find the life that they need in Christ, our billboards are ineffective. The gospel message that we have is not come to Jesus and have a good life. It's not, you know, well, things will be better once you come to Jesus. That is not our message, folks. The message that transform needs to be very clear, and it's simple. It is repent and be born again, be transformed in your life, right? 
Our gospel message is not a message to just come to Jesus. It's lose your life and you'll find it. Deny yourself and take up your cross. It is love the Lord with all, that's a big three-letter word right there, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. It is a message that says, it's no longer I that live, but Christ living in me. Now, that's not a bunch of messages. That's just one message. And it was basically what we were focusing on last Sunday, where Paul said, for me to live is Christ. For me to live is Christ. So in essence, the billboard is not really supposed to be your smiling face that, that says, I'm a good person and I'm living a good life. It's supposed to be you showing a transformation whereby the world has the ability to look at your life and the life that you're living and the gospel message is coming out of your life. And for them to say, there is where I can find hope for eternity. So let me take a moment here and ask the hard question. I got quite a bit of feedback after the first service. <laughs> Here's the question. What's on your billboard? What message is on your billboard? Is it clear? Does it absolutely point to him? Does it tell the world that Jesus is the only hope? And then if you are pretty sure that you got the right message on your billboard, my next question is, do you have the light on it? Because we're living in a dark age. Folks, we are. We're living in a, in a dark, it's always dark. It's beautiful out there, but we're living in a dark time all the time. And now more than ever before, there, that light on the billboard reflecting the message needs to be bright. It needs to be out there. And, and, and Jesus said these words in Luke eleven thirty five. 35. He said, be careful then that the light within you is not darkness. Now, how in the world does that happen? Be careful that the light within you is not darkness. You see, the, 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 the challenge is, is if the light is not penetrating through the darkness, maybe the light's gone dark. Sometimes you got a light bulb in the closet, but it's gone out. And, and, and you, you have to, to realize, I need to replace that. It's not doing its job anymore. Maybe the light is not shining like you think it is anymore. If so, it's time for a change. It's time to do something. So hear me when I say this. It might not be that you don't believe the right stuff. <laughs> it just might be that you don't live it for people to see it. Because see, it's, every one of us can be, you know, I've given my heart to the Lord. I love the Lord. My life is about him. Okay, fantastic. You, you, you got a good message there. But if you don't live that out, how's it gonna affect anybody else? So maybe you, maybe you know what you believe, but if you're not living what you believe, if you're not daring to let light really shine out of your life, what impact are you gonna have? Jesus went on to say in the very next verse of Luke eleven thirty six, 36, if your whole body is full of light, that's the challenge that he wants, is that our, whole, our body is full of light with no part of it in darkness. So we're not mixed. There's a little dark, there's a little light. It's all mixed in there together. Catch me on the right day, you'll see the light. Catch me on the wrong day, you'll see the dark. But if your whole body is full of light, you will be radiant, Think about that. You will be radiant as though a lamp were shining on you. Wow. If we're full of life, we'll be radiant. Now, remember how I challenge you or tease you or whatever you want to call it about, you know, my sermon is not being fun sermons. Okay, so this is the fun part of my sermon. 
you can be radiant. How cool is that? I mean, you can be, you can be the brightness at your work. You can be the brightness of the school you go to. You can be the brightness in the, in the, in the lounge when everybody's taking their breath. You can, you can be radiant. How cool is that? You know, if you, if you were an actor in entertainment magazine, whatever, came out and said, oh, his performance in this was radiant. You might be up for an Oscar. Well, listen, on the stage of life, your performance which should come natural to your love of Jesus, it ought to be radiant because what you're expecting when this life is over is far better than any Oscar because <laughs> the rewards are going to be great. You can be radiant. You should be. I should. We should be radiant. Now, that was the good part, the fun part. Brings me back to the other stuff now. If you are radiant, you will begin to bother the darkness and you will have conflicts. The absence of conflict in darkness is the absence of light. It's guaranteed to create conflict. Paul's life was radiant. And you know what it characterized? Conflicts everywhere he went. Everywhere he went, conflicts. He created opponents who literally, in many of the places that he was, did everything they could possibly do to put his light out. Now, where is that today? We're living in dark times. Where is that that feels so threatened that it says we got to put this light out? And see, the reason why it bothers them so much is because it brings to their awareness that they are wrong. They are not uh, lined up with God, that they will have judgment upon their life for the way that they're living. It brings those things to the surface and makes them, if they have a heart that's tender enough to turn and say, oh, Lord, forgive me. But if they have a bitterness and a hardness and make them turn and go, you know what, I'm going to put that light out. The absence of conflict and opponents is really the best way to measure the radiancy of your life and whether your life is being radiant. So here we have Paul, and he's going to sow this knowledge that he, this experience, into his fellow believers in the Philippians church. And so here's what he says to him. I'm reading it from our text again. So that I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. You see, he knew that if they begin, began to live the same manner of life that he had lived, that they were going to get the same results that they would have opponents. So he invested in them that, and, and, and tried to prepare them so that they would stand firm. They wouldn't, they wouldn't look at it and go, oh, this is terrible. No, this is natural. This was gonna happen. So he invested in them much like Jesus did his disciples. Jesus said to his disciples, he said, they're gonna hate you. Now, folks, I don't know if you realize that, but really and truly, when the church of Jesus Christ is being a radiant light, whether we see it or not, it's hated by many. But Jesus, he said, they're going to hate you because they hate me. 
If, if, they, if you were theirs, they'd love you. But because you're mine, they're going to hate you. And everybody in the church said, hate me, Lord, hate me. That's not our prayer, is it? No, we don't want to be hated. We don't want conflict. We don't, we, we don't want to be that person at the job that everybody's like, oh, don't let him get started talking about Jesus. Nobody seems to want to have that type of mentality. And yet the reality of it is, is Paul communicated this to Timothy, who would be pretty much the first person in line to step into many of his shoes in, in his ministries. And he says to him, and these are words, folks, these are chilling words when we really put them into the, the knowledge of what we have about what our job is here. He said, all who desire to live a godly life in Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So if, if those who live a godly life will be persecuted, then the question comes down to, is that the desire that you have in your godly life? Is the desire of your godly life to live in such a way that you draw conflict from darkness? Those who desire to live that life will find adversaries. And he knew that what was going to happen to them is what had happened to him. And that was that this was going to engage them into conflict. This was going to engage them into the same conflict that he had had, that he had struggled through all the years that had put him in prison where he's sitting right this moment, writing these words. That's how real it was. So he invested in them. Because when it came, he said, I want you to stand firm. I don't want you to look at it and, as like, oh, poor me. What if the mentality was as they, they had in the early church who when they got put into jail the first time, when they got their first beaten, when they got their first uh, admonishing, you can't keep preaching this gospel message, that they responded with this ideology that I don't know that we, we get anymore. And it's, Lord, thank you that we were able to share in what you have experienced for us. So he invested in them so that they would be strong. So I want you to consider what you're hearing today is my encouragement in you. Let's be radiant. Let's be radiant. And then it's also my investment in you <laughs> that when you are, it's going to create some opponents. Be ready. Because it's all right. There will be opponents, folks. And when you have an opponent, you have a conflict. How many of you have been enjoying this crazy, wild Kansas wind? Is that some ridiculous stuff? I mean, 45 mile an hour gusts the other day. I asked him in the first service, I said, did they finish the stretch between Oswego and here? And somebody said, nope, they're still on it. But I was there, I was the first car to get stopped. And um, the guy's there with his sign and the wind's blowing like 40 something miles an hour. And you know how it is when you're the first car there, that awkwardness where he's looking at you and you're looking at him and you're wondering, what do we do besides, I'll just find something around the car to look at. Well, anyway, so, so after we looked at each other for a little bit, I, uh, I saw he had his sign. It was so windy that day. And he had his sign and he couldn't hold it out because he couldn't contain it. So he put it up against himself. And then one of those gusts would hit. And so he'd be standing there like that. And then, then one of those gusts would hit and you'd see him it'd push him. And at one particular point, it was blowing hard enough that he sort of had his, his stance, like, you know, he's standing into it. And as I observed that, you know, God can talk in all kinds of moments. As I was observing that, I, I, I was noticing that he had to move his feet a little bit, but he wasn't giving up his position. He was supposed to be right there on that middle line, 
either stopping them or slowing them down or whatever. And we live in a time when standing firm does not mean you might not need a little footwork. It just means you can't give up ground. Folks, the church has given up too much ground. And whenever the darkness has resisted as light, we've just sort of diminished a little bit. And the darkness resists and we just diminish. And, and, and the word of the Lord for us today is, no, you're supposed to be radiant. You're not supposed to give ground. You're not supposed to back down. You're not supposed to allow the darkness to invade. Folks, the darkness has invaded the church in America. So much so that we don't know where the church stops and the world begins. The adverse win is going to be a battle, folks. But it will never overcome the church. We have the promises and the declaration of God. It will not. He will return. And what will he find? A glorious church. A glorious church. A radiant church that's not blemished, it's not in darkness, but reflecting the beautiful light of Jesus Christ. We must stand firm, folks. And here's the reason why. The ground we give up, we can't get back. We can give it up in one generation, and I don't know that the next three generations can gain it back. You can't give up ground. We can't give up ground anymore. We've got to let the light be the light. We've got to be those that, that let the light shine out of our lives. Our opponent is trying to take our ground. And here's the thing. When the conflicts arise... A lot of times people just step back because they don't want conflict. I asked you in the beginning, how many of you like conflict? I did not have one volunteer because we don't like conflict. We don't, we don't like adversaries. We don't, we, don't, we don't want that as a natural thing inside of our life. So we've developed a bit of a ease and just sort of no problem. And folks, there's a few of those. And I can't read what I got on my notes anymore. I've lost too much ground. You don't want conflict as a whole. This is a church that I would say does not, does not have people that want to create conflict. And I appreciate that. Trust me. As a pastor, a church that doesn't want conflict, doesn't have a bunch of conflicting people, hallelujah, that's a good thing. But to the same degree, look at me. This demands conflict. This is not a conflict that we need to shy away from. This is a conflict that needs to happen. The light needs to get brighter so that the darkness knows exactly where it's coming from. It's coming from a Christ-centered faith. And it needs to be there. This conflict is necessary. And that's why Paul continued preaching regardless of the difficulties that it caused him. That's the reason why he's, he's reaching out to them, trying to encourage them that, hey, you're going to have opponents. You're, you're, you're going to find them resisting, engaging in conflict with you. And look at what he says. And this is the way he ended his passage with him pretty much. He says, for it has been granted to you. Now, process that as personal, not to Philippians, but to you. It has been granted to you, to me, that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Why? 
because you're engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and that I now and that now here I still have. I'm in conflict because I preach the gospel. It creates a conflict. Because I live a radiant life, it creates a conflict. You've been invited, folks, to be a part of the joy of Jesus as your salvation and to be involved in the battle of righteousness. You've been invited into that. I'll start the verse, you finish it. John 10, 10, last part says, I came that you might have life and that you might have it more. What a fun word. Abundant. Abundantly. Did Jesus have an abundant life? Was it pretty full? Yeah. Yeah. How about Peter and Paul? Did they have an abundant life? Did, they, did the promise that Jesus gave that you'll have an abundant life if you follow me, did they have an abundant life? They did. So what did their life look like? Well, it looked like the joy of Jesus Christ in their life, didn't it? It looked like the power of God operating inside of them. And it looked like a whole bunch of conflict. I want to convince you that the abundant life is abounding in blessings. I want to challenge you that the abundant life is a bunch of Jesus. <laughs> a bunch of Jesus. Abundant means what? A lot of. A lot of. You've been invited to have an abundant life, and it is a lot of Jesus. And you know what comes with a lot of Jesus? Conflict. Because he's light in darkness. I believe if anybody could ever preach a sermon, and boy, I'll tell you what, there's been a lot of people preach on the abundant life. But if anybody could really preach that message, it would be Paul. And here's how he'd preach it. Philippians 3, 10, and I'm a few chapters ahead, I know. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. There's the abundant life that Paul would preach about. Here's what abundance is in Jesus. It is knowing him and the power of his resurrection. It's understanding the glory that he came. The son of God came. He died. He was buried. And yet death could not hold him. And in glory, he was resurrected. And he ascended. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, and with that comes the realization of what killed him being truth in a world of lies, being light and darkness, being hated because you revealed what was in their hearts. For Paul, the abundant life was known in Jesus and his power, but also in his mission. And it was knowing Jesus it, by saying, you know what, I have experienced his miraculous power, but I have also shared in his suffering. And I can testify he's faithful in both. If all we know is the good stuff, we have not experienced an abundant life. An abundant life is the fullness of everything that God has that comes with God. That's the abundance. So let me stop for just a moment. Are you interested in that? I mean, let's just be honest for a moment. Are you really interested in that? Lord, if to know you in the fullness of your power means knowing you 
in the heartbreak of rejection, I want to know you. If knowing you and seeing you work through me to transform lives means knowing you and the rejection of those that don't want to transform life and friendships in because of it, I want it. You see, that's tough questions to be asking. But that's where the abundant life really takes us. Not giving up our ground is where we find abundant living. It's where we live a radiant life. A radiant life is going to create conflicts. It will create conflicts. You can't turn on the light and the darkness not have to respond. You can't. And many of you know that, but I want to also get you to make sure you know this. You got to remain radiant in the conflict. See, sometimes we, with the, the radiance of, you know, trying to show the love of Jesus. But then when the conflict begins, sometimes we're not as radiant maybe as we were because now our feelings are hurt. Now we're just a little bit ticked off or angry or whatever. That's when the radiance has got to continue. So that like Stephen, when now the preaching of the gospel has brought a mob who is going to kill him with stones, he still has his eyes on the glorious redeemer, Jesus Christ. And can look at them and say, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't understand. Amen? I didn't get to finish Acts. One of my favorite stories in Acts is Paul standing in front of Agrippa. And he says these words, and these are my words, it's in, in, but it, it's, it's accurate in, in message. He looks at King Agrippa and he says, I wish you were what I am except for the chains. Oh, how glorious and radiant is a light that says, you know, I might be the prisoner, but I'm actually a slave set free. You're the king, but you're in prison. That the radiance would continue even when it gets hard because and we talked about this in the very first message that I had in Philippians in verse 10 about so that we are pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Folks, the most important thing we want to do besides be, blame, besides be radiant is to walk blameless. We want to be pure and blameless at the day we stand before Jesus Christ. And so I'm, I'm, I'm sharing that with you because here's, here's the reality of it. We shine the light of Jesus. It creates some opponents. It causes some conflicts. When the conflicts begin to come, there's the ability to compromise. There's the ability to back up, to give ground. But there's the ability to just get hurt, angered, resentment, Folks, back to what Jesus said. If they don't like you, you're actually in good company because they didn't like Jesus. If they begin to say things about you behind your back, you're in good company because they, they would spend a lot of time in the Sanhedrin plotting and talking. How can we get rid of this Jesus? You're in good company. So don't let, it, don't let it get into your emotions. It's God's intention that when the light begins to shine, the darkness is going to resist. So stay radiant, stay pure, stay blameless, and do not fight in the flesh. Use your spiritual weapons. Stay. Keep smiling. Because for the first time, maybe you are the brightest and most brilliant billboard you have ever been. Being the best light and witness of Jesus that you've ever been. Because you're conscious of what you're trying to convey. 
Would you stand with me? Thank you, Lord. I want you to just bow your heads, but I want you to tune in to my prayer. Listen really closely. Father, I pray that as we have accepted the work of Christ on the cross and the transformation that is brought into our life, help us to accept that that transformation was a transformation to make us like Christ and being transformed in to the image of Christ means that the abundant life of Christ is now in my life and, and, and that abundance creates a radiation if I will let it be bright and brilliant and try not to hide it under some bushel. But at the same time that it is a brilliant, radiant light for those around to see what Jesus has done and how powerful his transforming power is, it is also a testimony against darkness. So Lord, I pray, help us to be the bright light we're supposed to be. Help us to not give any more ground to the enemy because the conflicts that come, not because we're dumb, do dumb stuff, but the conflicts that come because we are showing the love of Jesus and the hope that we have in Christ, those conflicts, we need to welcome them just like they did those guys in Acts when they were thankful that they got to share in the same things and mistreatments that was poured out upon Christ. So help us, Lord. Help us. And if there's no conflicts in our lives, if there's no resistance to the light that we're trying to shine, then help us, oh God, to get our bulbs switched out. Because there needs to be light. I pray for light. And though I don't want to pick any fights with anybody, Lord, I pray that we're a bright enough light that we create conflicts with those who choose evil over good. Lord, let your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.